There are three ways to test a sample mean. One, with a confidence interval. Two, with a test statistic. And three, probably most efficiently, just with the p-value. So I like this problem in Miller because it's deceptively simple, yet allows us to explore several of the concepts in statistical inference. So here's the simple question. You are given the following sample of annual returns for a portfolio manager. And then the question gives us what the numbers that are highlight, highlighted in yellow. And so these are 10 annual returns for the portfolio manager. And so that's all the question gives us. Then it asks, if you believe that the distribution of returns has been stable over time and will continue to be stable over time, how confident should you be that the portfolio manager will continue to produce positive returns? So the question is really asking us, what's our confidence level that this manager actually generates real alpha or that their true return is at least greater than zero? Okay, so the spreadsheet does some of the manual calculations that we don't need to do in Excel, but that are nevertheless good learning opportunities, I think. So here in this column, where we have the average square difference and the sum of square differences. So these are a key uh, measurement. This first value, 193.2, uh, that's just the X observation. That's the first return in the series of negative seven. So it's the observation minus the average in the series. That difference gets squared, it's 193.2. So we have here the series of squared differences such that the average of the series of squared differences is what we call the population variance. And then here is the sum of the squared differences that we're going to use for the sample variance. So over here we have count, almost always denoted with an N, N equals 10. And so, by the way, we have a small sample. When the sample, in general terms, less than 30 is a small sample. Our degrees of freedom is N minus 1 for a test of the sample mean. And so the degrees of freedom here is 9. The sample mean here, just an average of the values that were given, is 6.9. Then the sample, the sample variance is the sum of the squared differences divided by our degrees of freedom, or n minus 1. And so you can see this 552.5. And of course, that's a value that we can use Excel to get the sample variance, as long as we remember that we really want the sample variance here. We, really, we don't really want dot p, we want dot s. And we give it the values, and we should get that same 552.5. And then, of course, the square root of the sample variance is the sample standard deviation. And so the standard deviation of our sample here, of our small sample, is 23.51. And so then we get here to a, a really important uh, estimate, that, and that is the standard error. And the standard error, I'm going to write it over here, so I can be really clear about the standard error, is going to be the sample standard deviation, which I'm denoting with a capital S instead of with a sigma, because the Greek sigma connotes a population, um, would, would connote a population value, but the S, which is Roman, is appropriate for the sample. So our standard error is a sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N, which in this case is 23.51, which is the sample standard deviation that we just computed, divided by the square root of n, that's our small sample of 10, and our standard error is 7.433. Okay, so we will need that for the test of the sample mean. Um, although we're going to have three ways to go about this, but they're all the same essential mechanics. In two of those three ways, we do want to specify a confidence level. And so pretty typical here is the 95%, but I've got it in yellow. Um, and that can, so that can be changed in the spreadsheet, of course. And then, the, so the confidence level is 95%. That means one minus the 95% is 5%, and that's the significance level. Um, denoted alpha. And so I think it's helpful to um, just note what I put here in the spreadsheet. 
So the significance level of 5% follows from 1 minus the confidence level that we select. But statistically, this 5% now is also the probability that we commit a type error conditional on a true null hypothesis. Okay, so given um, in the case of, we are testing a, a sample mean here, so we're the appropriate distribution is a student's T distribution as, um, when the sample is small. In fact, um, the, the fact that the sample is small, this is really conditional on us assuming that this population distribution is normal. If the population distribution is normal and it's a small sample, we can use the student's T, but otherwise we're not really justified. Okay, so then when the sample gets larger, above 30, um, it's also the student's T. So really, it's the student's T is justified for a test of the sample mean. If the sample is small, conditional on that assumption of normality. But as it gets larger, the thing is, we use the, the, the student's T converges on the normal, and we can just use the normal distribution. We're in a small sample here, so we really have to use the student's T. And so we have cr the critical lookups here. So we could use the lookup table, but an Excel also gives us these functions. These are, after all, just quantile functions or inverse cumulative distribution functions. And we can do a two-tailed T or a one-tailed T. Because what we're getting here is, I won't be very good at this, at drawing this, but if we imagine the student's T, and I'm drawing it, it looks normal, but remember it's, uh, it's got always fatter tails um, than the normal as a function of the degrees of freedom. So as the sample size increases, it converges on normal. We're pretty small here, so we definitely have fatter tails than the normal. But um, in the case of a 95% uh, confidence and a two-tailed critical value, what, what is getting returned here by the inverse function is this 2.262. Um, this function is taking 5% as an input, you can see here, and it's finding the associated quantile such that each of these tails, the student T being statist symmetric, has 2.5% of the area of the whole. So 2.5% of the area is at this quantile, 2.62. That's how we get this critical value. Now, if it's a instead, I'm going to instead same distribution as informed by the degrees of freedom, but if instead we want one tail or one sided confidence, then it's looking, I, I've gone a little over scale here, but then it's um, looking for the quantile associated with 5% tail here. So you can see that's going to need to be over to the left and it's 1.833. So these critical or lookup values take the significance level as an input, in this case 5%, and they return the associated quantile that looks for either half of that significance in the tail, in the case of a two-sided test, or all of that significance in the tail in the case of a one-sided test. Okay, so that seems like a lot, but it's all we need to conduct any of the tests of this sample mean. And I'm going to, um, just in order to keep my canvas as clean as possible or as less cluttered as possible, I'm going to move down, move the, the raw data out of the way. And then here I'm just repeating some of that same information, including these critical values. And I forgot to mention, right, that these critical values are going to vary, and you'd see this in the in the back of a statistics textbook that it's laid out in a matrix. That's because uh, they are a function of two things here. They're a function of our confidence and significance level, of course, but also the in the case of the students T, the degrees of freedom, the which is sample size minus one. So the smaller the sample, the fatter this distribution, and the larger these uh, critical values will be. So that first approach here is with the confidence interval approach. And this is carving out a confidence interval for us, starting with the observed sample mean, 
of, we'll just say 6.9 here. 6.9 is what we observe. And then it's going each way with a, what we could call a margin of error. And that margin of error is just the product of the uh, critical, the lookup value or critical value mul multiplied by the standard, of er standard error. So you can see it's going to go minus, in this direction, it's going minus the critical or lookup value of 2.262 multiplied by the standard error of 7.433, and it's arriving over here at negative uh, 9.9. And then over here, and I'm just going to say it's adding the same thing. It's adding the critical T multiplied by the standard error instead of subtracting the critical T and standard error. And it's going to get over here 23.7. So we start at the sample mean and we add or subtract the product of the critical T and the standard error. And that's because the critical T is a really a standard standard deviation and we're scaling it by the standard error, which is really the standard deviation of the sample that we collected. So we're just in, we're really just scaling the uh, uh, student's T or critical value. And so we end up here with a confidence interval and the this is also called a random interval because the way to think about this is that there is the idea is there is a true population mean somewhere we're in this case wondering if it's zero and obviously that's located w within this interval here um, however the confidence interval is varying with each sample. So the confidence interval has sampling variation as do the samples. So that's why it's also called a random interval. And that means that the way we think about this is that every time we do a sample, we'll get a different confidence interval. And 95% of these random intervals will contain that single true population mean that we're, that we're hypothesizing about. Okay, so we can see here that that zero that we're hypothesizing about, um, it is within this confidence interval. So we would fail to reject either a one or two sided null hypothesis that the alpha here is zero. Um, okay, so then just the last thing is the significance approach and the p value. So our null hypothesis here is that the mean is zero. And under this approach, we want to do a computed t value. So that's the test statistic. And that so that's important. And the test statistic is going to be given by, um, it's always the case that we take the observed sample mean minus the hypothesized population mean. And that numerator is a raw distance. So we standardize it, standardize it by dividing by the standard error. So in this case, we have observed sample mean of 6.9 and uh, our hypothesized null alpha, our null value is that, uh, our null hypothesis is that the alpha is zero. So it's really a zero here. And as is some, often the case, and our standard error, of course, is 7.433. And so our critical or computed T value, not our critical, I'm sorry, our computed T value or our test statistic is 0 0.93. And so again, the um, numerator was the raw difference from our observation and our, our null hypothesized value that is being standardized. So in, in the way to look at this is that we are only 0.93 standard, standard deviations away from the hypothesized value, which just intuitively is not very far. And so not far enough to reject the null hypothesis. So this is consistent with that confidence interval finding. And then it's going to be also be consistent, and you can see we reject here in the spreadsheet, we uh, reject both the two and one sided null. So then we also have the p values. Arguably, this is the, the most efficient way to go about this is with the p values. Let me move that cursor up if I can. 
And <clears throat> what the p-values are doing is I'll take my student's t distribution again. Not very good. Well, here, a little fatter if I can. Still not very good. Workable. And here we have the mean. And our 18.9% p-value. The p-value is uh, just using Excel's t dist t dist function. So that's the built-in distribution function, and it's accepting that for its input the computed t t value of 0.93, which is a quantile. So I uh, maybe too uh, maybe a little bit too far over, but we're, we have we have observed here a 0 0.93. And again, in other words, our, we are 6.9 away from the zero that we hypothesize, but in standard units, it's only 0 0.93 because our standard error is pretty wide at 7.4. So our computer t-value is 0 0.93, and the one-sided p-value is 18.9%, and the two-sided p-value is 37.8. So the two-sided p-value is probably the more common because by default, we tend to use a two-sided test and it's telling us 37.8%. And what that means is it's accepting here the 0 0.93 as the computed value and telling us that in both of these tails, this t distribution being symmetric, or in each of these tails, there is 18.9% over here and 18.9% over here. Under, under the two-sided case, adding them up, that's 37.8. And so um, that would be for a two-sided null where the null hypothesis would be, that would be where we are saying that alpha is equal to zero such that the alternative is that alpha is not equal to zero. Okay, but that's not actually what the question asks. The question um, implicitly is that the alpha is less than or equal to zero because our alternative hypothesis is that this manager actually has a true positive return and the alpha is greater than zero. So that's why we have the one-sided test and that's why the one-sided p-value is 18.9% because the computed t-value of 0 0.93, I'm really, forget this part, is telling us that 18.9% is the probability of ending up in this tail. Again, that's where the null is that the population return is less than or equal to zero. The null always contains the equal, such that if we can reject the null, we can say that this manager generates positive alpha. And so this is, in fact, is the answer to the question in Miller. It's 18.9%, or depending on how you want to look at it, the answer is 81.1%. But we can reject this null with 81.1% confidence. So normally that's not enough confidence, but just in practical terms, we can say, yeah, we can reject this null, and yes, we think this manager's true return is at least zero, or true return is positive, and we are 81.1% confident of that. Um, not, not con that's not, that's not nearly 95%, hence our inability to reject the null under the normal test. But we could still make this statement that if the p-value is 18.9%, we, we can reject that null and find in favor of this manager generated a positive return with a softer confidence of 81.1%. And so that's basically uh, the three different ways that we could test this. Again, that's with the, uh, g given that we've computed the standard error, we've observed a sample mean, we can compute the confidence intervals. We can compare the computed value to the test statistic. And finally, maybe most efficiently, we can just generate the p-value and then interpret the p-value. So I'll, I'll upload the spreadsheet and I hope that's helpful.